First, a review. In part one, we went over the Heinrich events, the cold epics of Earth, the magnetic shifts, the excursions, and their half cycles matching up with the Heinrich events and cold events, even where the suspiciously long gap in the recognized events does have a major downspike indeed, and it's on the cycle mark. On top of the magnetic events and cold matching up, there are volcanoes and biosphere stresses associated as well. Combined, we need to explain all this evidence and the cycle, including the inclusion of nova-level isotopes in the microtectites and bones of animals in the surge deposits from those periods. To explain everything together, we need a major event on the sun. And to explain the ongoing process, the cycle, we may need something a bit more. When Billy hit the juice to the sphere magnet in our plasma lab, I knew immediately what we were seeing. The flare activity in the electric corona, the torus around the belly. It was what would be expected of an electrodynamic sphere magnet system. It doesn't just work in the lab. It works at planets, stars, and galaxies. And the best we have to study is the solar wind current sheet. It separates the interplanetary magnetic field of the sun's solar wind, denoting the magnetic reversal point, extending out from the interior torus and bringing a plasma density shift. While it takes a year for us to orbit the sun and we cross the sun's equator only twice in that year, the current sheet hits Earth every 7 to 10 days for a couple hours. This sheet delivers geomagnetic unrest, can trigger full-fledged geomagnetic storms, and induces current into the atmosphere and the ground. Now on the galactic level, the sheet isn't much different. Whether an active star-bursting galaxy or a more stable and mature one like our Milky Way, just as the solar wind Parker spiral matches the spiral arms of the galaxy, the sun's current sheet matches the rippling electric field of the galaxy. The main difference in character is while the sun has cleared the dust levels in the solar system, the galactic sheet carries it. From the galaxy, from the nova events, and from the stars pushing it out into the interstellar medium. Given that we are further out in the galaxy than Earth is relatively in the solar system, a good approximation is that the solar system spends about 200 or so years within the sheet of the galaxy every 12,000 years or so as we orbit the galaxy on the millions of year scale. Now, in part one, we arrived at the sun from the Earth evidence. Can we do the same from the galaxy using a cyclic crossing of the galactic current sheet, plasma and dust fluctuations, and the galactic magnetic reversal that comes with it? Well, first, we have to start with what stars do. There are many kinds of nova, and most are not supernova. Most are recurrent, over and over, with the appropriate instigation. The most well-studied mechanism for recurring nova is when a white dwarf star sucks material off a degenerate giant star. It accumulates in the atmosphere, blocks the outward light and particle escape, and then the star blows off that accumulated outer shell. But what we've been watching is that model breaking down. Now they include plasma turbulence triggers, recognize many recurrent nova to have no partner, and many that show different kinds of stars feeding the material for accretion. And as the poor little star found out when it wandered into a molecular cloud and exploded, really all you need is some way to begin that accretion or accumulation process. These developments expanding the potential triggering mechanisms for smaller versions of the nova most of us think about came simultaneously with confirmation of the need for recent nearby nova events. You see, not only do we have those nova isotopes, but some of them have half-lives that tell us they shouldn't be here because they couldn't have been here when the solar system formed. That's too long ago. And they likely didn't come from far away because they wouldn't have arrived before the half-life expired the sample. Then, when we finally modeled magnetic fields of nova remnants, they found the dust carrying the isotopes cannot even escape the remnant. It's trapped like a dusty magnetic pinball. Oh, it is a recent nearby nova indeed. Very nearby. So cyclically, predictably, in a pattern, the solar system will be hit with a galactic current sheet. Its galactic magnetic reversal and plasma character will induce electric currents on the sun and overall magnetic perturbations, all while the extra dust and gas attracted by the galactic sheet like a Swiffer duster would in your home is delivered to the inner solar system to potentially accumulate in the sun's atmosphere. The Earth evidence says we need a nova on a cycle because magnetic excursions, volcanoes, and cold events shouldn't be coming together in a pattern unless there is also a pattern of a massive electromagnetic blast from the sun 
whose dust blocks out the sunlight thereafter to cool the world, and which induces so much electricity into the mantle, it triggers major volcanoes. The galactic sheet is set to deliver the electromagnetic and particle requirements to the sun every 12,000 years, and there's your cycle. And what do you know? Both that paper from Christmas Day and the confirmation in the top geophysical outlet on Earth describe how the sun's current sheet electrodynamically couples with our planet, clouds up the Earth, agglomerating and accumulating the dust and water vapor and aerosols together. And that's literally the exact thing we're describing with the recurrent solar micronova, only the galactic sheet also delivers a ton of dust. And this is where the Earth evidence meets the implications of the applied galactic astrophysics of a rotating plasma, electric field, and sphere magnet system. And now is a good time to mention that all of catastrophism comes down to three things. The whole has only three pieces. Number one, the evidence of the past. We went over much of that in part one, although we didn't touch the massive waves that do seem to deluge the planet during these times. This is important because you can't know there is a cycle until you have the information. Number two, the disaster mechanism. Using that evidence and what you know scientifically, you formulate a hypothesis for how this disaster works. Most of the time, it does not match up as well as it does in this video, coming from both sides. And number three, predicting the next one. That's it. Everything in catastrophism can be broken down into the evidence, the mechanism, and the foresight. The purpose of deciphering the evidence on Earth is to develop a mechanism, which we did and explained in these first two parts of the series. In part three, coming before the new year, we'll do number three, predict the next one. Once again, using evidence from the surroundings and the ongoing progress of the galactic sheet mechanism, as it is already being observed, with changes here at the Earth, the other planets, and the nearby stars. Subscribe, and I'll see you for the morning update. Be safe, everyone.